Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, VP of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Ian Thornton Trump, who is the CISO of Cyjax and sometimes contributor to the Tripwire State of Security blog as well. Welcome, Ian. My pleasure to be here today, Tim. So we're here to talk a little bit about two topics that that have kind of an intersection. One is the the evolution of nation state attackers and nation state attacks, and the other is the the role of disinformation um, in enterprise information security. Uh, these are both topics that, uh, you know, depending on the day of the week, um, are uh, you know sort of at the top of the headlines. And I think, for my part, I, I wanted to start with the the nation state piece of it because. It seems normal these days to talk about nation state attackers as part of the cybersecurity landscape, but it hasn't always been the norm. So as a starting point, how did we get here? How did we get to this point where the idea that nation states are actors in this cybersecurity uh, you know, threatscape is a, is a normal thing? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question that has, you know, a lot of different aspects to it. And I'm going to try and keep it really kind of high level and, and more along a strategy. Um, the first is, um, I think from the uh, countries and organizations and businesses that are pointing the finger, um, there is a sense that they don't want to admit uh, the fact that many of their own citizens are actively engaged in cyber criminal activity and that what they're trying to position is essentially one of othering the countries and suggesting that those are protagonists as opposed to the fact that they're just all a bunch of criminals and it doesn't really matter where they're based it doesn't really matter what ethnicity they are the viewpoint is is that or um, countries are responsible for the conduct of their citizens so even though a Russian can be, you know, arrested in Uzbekistan, the, it, it will be labeled a Russian cyber criminal. And that is an S, that's simplistic, um, way of understanding what the nation state is really about in terms of its protagonism. And I think the next part of that is again, when you look at the attacks that are being conducted today by the um, uh, by malicious cyber actors, they're facilitated and in a lot of ways complicit with other organizations that have aided and abetted the attack itself. So despite the fact that there might be you might be able to reasonably point your finger and say this Polish hacker was the one that got in her bank. When you get below the surface, you see that that Polish hacker had, um, uh, you know, compromised other servers um, in other countries. They had perhaps even rented infrastructure in the uh, victimized country itself. So, you know, we're trying to explain something um, in very simplistic terms when it's actually very complex. Uh, this is one of my, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a pet peeve or a favorite topic. I'm, I'm not sure which it is, but this, this idea that, that, um, you know, the headlines that are published are effectively, uh, you know, a, a misinformation campaign or a disinformation campaign. I don't, I don't think there's malicious intent behind them, but, um, other than to, to generate clicks, but this idea that, that it's overly simplistic and that we can't distinguish effectively without really doing a lot of work. The difference between a uh, uh, an attacker who happens to be of Russian nationality, an attacker who happens to be physically present in Russia, and an attacker who happens to be uh, or who is sponsored by the Russian state. You know, you could substitute other countries there, but that distinction is not one that 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 is uh, you know discussed commonly in the in the cybersecurity media. 
No, and the global police of the internet right now are certainly the United States and the Department of Justice and its efforts to go after cyber criminals wherever they uh, may be. And it's interesting because it is um, a way of, and just as those protagonistic nations are doing, is, you know, claiming that your house is in order. It's the disorder and the lack of um, legal um, uh, and enforcement of, you know, norms of governments in other countries that's the problem. But meanwhile, you know, many American companies are only too happy to take the money of cyber criminals and, um, you know, ha facilitate those attacks upon their own nation state, right? So, so, you know, there is an element of trying to suggest that the problem that we have today in cybersecurity is everybody else except the victim. So is this a, is there, um, this makes me think of, of the, the analogy or a potential analogy to content moderation on, on social media platforms with, uh, you know, support by, infrastructure providers for, um, you know, criminal activity. So you take things like, you know, AWS, Azure, Google, cloud providers, you could take Bitcoin if you wanted, that they have a similar problem to Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, in that their infrastructure supports activity that's either illegal or undesirable, but that they, they, they absolve themselves of responsibility for dealing with that problem because of the, the way they've structured that infrastructure. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's sympt it's the symptomatic of we built the world's most largest complex machine and nobody has set forth any rules and norms of discussion and behavior. And when we have attempted to do that at a nation state level, it's always going to be biased towards the citizens of that particular nation to the exclusion of other nations. So, you know, it's absurd that Canada once tried to order Google to remove search results globally. Um, you know, these are the realities of this thing that we, we built on and we all jumped on. And, you know, there's tremendous amount of commercial opportunity in that space. But there's also a major policy problem that the Western nations, the G20, for instance, are faced with. And the fact of the matter is, is they cannot and will not ever eliminate cybercrime because if they did, they would have put a $500 billion per year or um, uh, econ economic part of their economy um, that is posting double-digit growth rates completely. So if you've built all of this anti-cybercrime and um, cybersecurity capability, you do it around the idea that you know, you need a protagonist. And so, you know, no one is ever going to solve the cybercrime problem. What we need to do is to take a risk management approach to it, and we do the best we can with this, which is essentially the Wild West. I want to point out one thing that I think we, we you've implied here, but we didn't call out explicitly, which is that the, the same um, evolution of technology and infrastructure that supports you know, sort of the massive global expansion of of industry, you know, around the internet and connectedness in general, also creates the opportunity for nation states to move from, you know, sometimes occasional cyber attackers to, uh, you know, effectively cyber attacks being a part of their their overall strategy, you know, strategic yeah. military plan, if you will. A hundred percent. And this is all about, you know, I, I liken it to, you know, the two ways to get ahead in the world, right? The first way is to work really hard, distinguish yourself and, you know, build your career um, by, you know, um, supporting others along the way. The other strategy is to make people feel like their country is the only country that will ever look after them and will provide for them and that all other countries are terrible, evil, filthy places to live, right? And so part of this um, aggressive cyber posture that you see from nation states is fundamentally based on, and these disinformation campaigns that are supported by these nation states targeting each other, are really around the idea of making your, are, are for domestic consumption 
to placate your citizenry that you can continue on your path, um, you know, and compel these giant nations uh, to do your will. You know, nothing is more blatant than what the Iranians are doing right now with um, cyber attacks and provocative actions in order to force one of the world's most powerful nations back to the negotiating table. There is no other opportunity out there for them to engage because all other avenues are basically prevented. And so, you know, when you cut off a nation to uh, the economic system, when you cut off the nation uh, in terms of like its ability to interact with other nations, which is largely done over the over the internet in terms of meetings and stuff like that, when you constrict the um, the export and import controls for commodity software, I'm not talking about anything that's highly classified, then what you've done is you've created the problem. Uh, and that nation is going to react. They're going to react in the best way and, and using the, all the capabilities that they have. And right now, one of the most powerful capabilities they have is that internet connection, which we seem, even though we've told these nations, you know, we're not going to allow it. We're going to sanction you, et cetera, et cetera. But hey, it seems like you're able to, um, potentially license software and use stuff illegally in your country with no repercussions whatsoever. No, by the way, we'll accept your ta traffic and we won't deny it. So, you know, sanctions don't mean sanctions anymore. And when you have, you know, um, blockchain, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin solutions that are out there, you'll quickly find that, you know, the entire financial system and all the rules that we've had since somebody invented banks back in Roman times have now been circumvented. So, you know, I'm just going to give a final analogy so you can see what this means. It's like, you know, the automobile has been around for more than a 100 years. We, with the internet, right now are in the phase where we're thinking that maybe seatbelts and speed limits might be a good idea. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com It strikes me that this is not these aren't new tactics it, they're just sh the same tactics shifted you know with the technology and how the, and the you know the changes that have occurred in the world so you know we've always had this uh you know geopolitical tool of sanctions and there's always been uh ways around it you know it's 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 not unlike um you know, if you if you refuse to sell military, uh, you know, equipment and weapons to one country, another country might choose to sell it to them as well. The difference is that the the interconnectedness that comes with the the internet today and the associated technologies is different. It used to be that if you wanted to sell weapons to uh, a country that you know one other country didn't want to, you would have to figure out how to manufacture those weapons yourself. Like you, that's they, correct. You, yeah, and that that problem has kind of gone away with the internet. Now it's more. I can always get a hold of the quote unquote metaphorical weapons and pass them along somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we're seeing that recycle reuse approach and that's gone from, you know, nation state, um, capabilities, you know, developed by APT 28 and then the unfortunate NSA leak of eternal, uh, blue and double pulsar. And all of a sudden, you know, everybody is now armed with potentially strategic weapons that can attack national critical infrastructure. Yeah. So let's let's connect the dot to disinformation here, because I, I we could keep down on this topic for a while, but I want I did say there were two topics to talk about at yeah. the beginning, and I want to connect them. So the other trend that we see is, especially in political discourse, is the rise of disinformation as a, a political tool mm -hmm. on social media platforms primarily. Yeah. Um, so that's clearly a problem. But how is that problem related to cybersecurity? It's interesting because you know the mindset that we are faced with 
um, with, I would say almost changed within the last five to 10 years. Um, we're, we don't, we're not giving our enough, ourselves enough time to perform analysis because when you search for the truth, the only way you end up getting to the truth is by doing the analysis on the discourse. What is happening is because the discourse is so loud, because the discourse is liked and shared by troll farms, because the discourse is given, you know, a 45 second soundbite on the major news, we're accepting that as, oh yeah, that's just how things are. And we're not sitting down and, and doing our research. And this is how the rise of anti-science has occurred. This is how divisive issues, which should be really straightforward, get this thing because it will save your life, get confused because you go onto Facebook and, you know, your aunt is sharing something that all the scientists and doctors have missed. And so where, where we're failing at this and why disinformation has attacked sort of cybersecurity in a way is both have the fear, uncertainty, and doubt and offer a level of comfort and exclusivity, right? This has been a time-honored tradition in cyber um, uh, security vendors. It has been a time-honored tradition in nation-state actors. And you're 100% right. We used to drop leaflets on the enemy to demoralize them with stories about how powerful we are. Now what we'll do is we'll just turn off their power during winter. Or weaponize refugees um, to destabilize a country. Um, so, so we're at, we're in a new post-truth era, and the only way I see of us regaining that is taking a longer view and doing analysis, rather just accepting what people are talking about um, on social media, either anonymously or through you know various. Um, uh, deliberate campaigns of disinformation and accepting that as the truth. I think we've gotten lazy. Yeah, so that, that makes sense. I mean, I, I, it's interesting because I had, um, at my, at my university graduation, uh, the commencement speaker, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, said one of the things that's changed is the speed at which people receive information and the impact that it's had, which people weren't talking about at the time is that it means people don't think about their decisions because they get the information so fast they don't have a built-in delay i don't have to wait for a letter to show up in the physical mail and as a consequence people don't think about decisions as much it's something that that stuck with me and it's something that leads to that that disinformation uh the disinformation situation that we're in now but if 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 i'm an organization um if i'm a business how does the, the the disinformation problem affect me? How do those campaigns affect me as a, a cybersecurity practitioner? It's going to make you work a lot harder to gain trust. And I think I think this is where transparency, openness, and trust has now become the most important marketing and the most important sales tool that you can have. Because it once it's won, it takes an awful lot of effort to keep it. You know, you're one data breach away from losing all of your customers. Um, you know, th th this is a reality. But the reality of that statement was based in an incorrect assumption that the, that apparently a long time ago was attributed to the, um, United States small business, um, uh, uh, small business community, which said, you know, you know, um, Six months after a cyber attack, you know, 75 or 80 percent of firms go out of business. So the, the problem is we equate these statistics to what the actual experience is. And as we all know, everyone has a different experience on summer holidays. Right. And and so it's really hard to contextualize the big numbers that we see about the growth in cybercrime and and, you know, the damage that ransomware can be done when you don't have a accurate um, and valid uh, experience with it. So in a way, you're living vicariously um, through the variously tainted media that we have when it comes to cybercrime activity and the efforts of, you know, uh, organizations to stop cybercrime. I mean, I see these types of things all the time that, you know, um, phishing emails are responsible for the most devastating attack. Well, in some cases, sure. In others, 
Maybe it was your VPN or your remote desktop protocol open to the internet that led to the devastating cyber, cyber attack you faced. So, so, you know, you know, I've heard this statistic, which, you know, it just boggles my mind that, you know, 85%, I think it was, of, um, cyber attacks are because of human mistake. Mm, really? Are you considering, you know, patching and updating a server or failing to do that a human mistake? We're painting with a really broad, uh, broad brush. And unfortunately, a lot of people with a lot of times on their hand are, are, are working at emotionally manipulating you into believing their version of the truth as opposed to seeking it out yourself through you doing your own analysis, doing your own proof of concepts. So it, it sounds like what you're saying is that there's um, there's a spectrum of disinformation, and at, at one end of that spectrum, we've we've got what we would sort of perceive as as blatantly, obviously, you know, disinformation part of information part of a disinformation campaign. Like on the political spectrum of discourse, this is the uh, you know, like Trump is an alien or Biden is an alien kind of disinformation, obviously wrong but dis designed to clearly reinforce a particular worldview. But at the other end of that spectrum of disinformation, you have a more sort of insidious type of disinformation that takes advantage of what you just described as sort of the, the post-truth era, where it's not that the information is clearly wrong. It's more that it's it's biased towards a particular conclusion. That might or be a partially vendor. partially true. Partially that's true. The, that's the other problem that we have right. is that you know, you and I can go to the same concert and depending on where we're sitting, depending on, you know, what happens, one of us, probably me, is going to get beer spilled all over them and you are going to have a great time and I'm going to have a, a not so great a time because I'm covered in beer. Um, so, so again, it's, it's like, the, it's so difficult now because of the complexity in cybersecurity today to take you know, the top five use cases and apply them into, you know, the mass market, small, medium and business world because each of those firms has a particular product or service that they've created, that they've gone to market with. Each of those companies has, you know, you know, different suppliers in order to provide that product and service. So, so the complexity that we have allows these partial truths to infiltrate and then become a um a complete reality and and i think that's the problem that we're faced with is because you know when we strongly and passionately believe something is real we take comfort in it and so what businesses are looking for today believe it or not and this is again you know my opinion of having worked in this field for quite some time is they're looking for assurance and they're looking for comfort they're not looking for technology. And, and I think, you know, as we move forward, you know, we begin to try and see that our assumptions about what we had five or 10 years ago that prevented, you know, um, cyber attacks is now proving completely inadequate in terms of defending us. Um, so, so again, you know, there's, there's some comfort in, uh, in the nostalgia of the path, uh, of the past, but it completely, um, makes it difficult to evolve. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. I'm stuck on this idea of of what we're looking for in cybersecurity is 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 comfort and assurance because it's a very in a in a technology heavy field it's a very human characteristic mm -hmm. and um and it reminds me that behind the scenes at the end of the day you know we're talking about human beings right we're talking about people who have a job to protect the bi a business and in order to do their job uh, you know they need to feel like they've implemented the right Technologies, the right controls to to deliver on that 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 task, that job that they have, and they're looking at their own job security. Of course, you know I don't want to get fired because of of, a, of an incident. So, um, the idea of of security vendors delivering comfort and assurance is a, is an interesting one. I think it's where we ended up because 
everybody is selling, you know, some sort of solution to the marketplace right now. And, you know, the idea that, you know, you can easily replace one solution for another is, is, is not uh, a, a valid idea. We know how difficult it is sometimes to switch over platforms or to implement new. Um, and sometimes we're playing catch up, especially in the post pandemic world with um, all of the things that we needed to do in order to keep our businesses on when suddenly, you know, 85, 90 percent of our workforce was now work from home. The crappy little VPN connection the network guys had isn't wasn't going to scale to to manage you know the hundred or two hundred users that now had to essentially be branch offices. So so where where I'm going with this is that it used to be and and I think pre COVID it used to be that you bought this product and you know you um, you engaged uh, with the, the the technical folks only you know. In, in, in dire circumstances. Um, and somehow your own ego got in the way of doing the training or reading the manual, right? And yeah. so when now what you need as a CISO, as an IT manager or IT director, is you need to be able to call up you technical people to get questions to tough answers. And you need to you need to look at cybersecurity challenges as an obstacle course that you've got to train for. Okay. You can't just sort of look at it and go, yeah, I think I might be able to walk along that balance beam, right? You, you literally need somebody holding your hands, a vendor holding your hands so that when you're walking across that balance beam, you know that if you kind of screw up or, or slip on something, they'll be there to help you out. Because this is now, and this is, you know, it used to be parodies of like the IT security guy that was just like smashing away on, on his computer for like eight hours a day. That mythology, I think, was maybe one of the most destructive things to our industry that we've ever seen because now this is a team sport and it's not just a team of technical people. It's your whole business that needs to be on board security because if you don't get them there, you're just going to fail at it. You know, I think that's that's maybe the 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 best closing for this episode of the podcast that uh, that I could possibly come up with. Uh, you know, this security is a team sport, and it it makes me think that what we're looking at here is uh, the rise of the value of expertise over the the technology, um, and I that'll be a really interesting trend to pay attention to if if that's if that's where we're headed. Absolutely. I think it, I think that's exactly where we're at right now because we moved a lot of stuff to the cloud. And I know a lot of organizations to do that rapidly, perhaps put security on the back seat. And that's coming back to haunt us. So absolutely, uh, team sport, bring in people with different experiences, different skills, different capabilities aligned to the business's objectives. And I think you'll get through 2022. No telling what happens for 2023, though, mate. Ian, I want to thank you for spending the time uh, with me today. I think it was it was super interesting. Um, we could keep talking for a long time, but uh, we're we're at the end of the time. Appreciate that. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thanks to everyone uh, who listened. Um, I thought that was a super interesting conversation for me, and I hope it was interesting for you as well. And uh, I hope you tune in for the next episode of the Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.